Dear Church, we want you to understand the great riches in Jesus. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the insurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. And remember, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are richer than you think. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to everybody watching online, everybody that is in the room. My name's Pete, and uh, I have been struggling with my voice all week, as some of you experienced along with me uh, last week. And so I'm going to do my best to remain calm. And so I may seem calmer than usual. I may seem, I'm going to do my best not to get excited, because uh, I think that's when my voice will leave me. But we are in this series called You're Richer Than You Think. And it's a series that, uh, or it's a line uh, from, uh, from a bank that you may know, but this is not sponsored by a bank uh, of any kind. Uh, but it's a line that's, that's meant to be for those who are not yet followers of Jesus to realize that because Jesus is alive, you're richer than you think. Because Jesus is alive, there is, a, there is an unclaimed inheritance that you have. There's something that is waiting for you to discover. And the most simplest way I could, could say it, describe it, would be that it is life. That life abundant is waiting for you to find. Because Jesus is alive, you are richer than you think. And then for those of us who are followers of Jesus, maybe we've been followers for a long time, um, you also may, may be richer than you think. Because there's something that happens to us that a familiarity with our faith can set in. You know, some of us have been following Jesus for decades. Some of us, it's been like, like imagine, it's like 60 years, 70, 80 years, some of you have been following. 80 Christmases. Do you get hyped up for Christmas still? It's, I don't know. Yeah, good, good. Somebody with 80 has got more voice than I do today. You know, you can get, can, things can become familiar. You can, you can not let the, the good news of King Jesus permeate all of your life. It's easy to kind of keep him in this category and, and not allow this good news to actually fill your whole life. And so, so for many of us who have been followers for a long time, I submit to you as well, perhaps you too are richer than you think because Jesus is alive and his kingdom is beginning here and now. And so the way that we've chosen to explore this phrase or this idea that there is richness in the good news of Jesus is to walk through the book of Colossians. And so if you have a Bible with you, if you have a digital device of any kind, I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter one. We're gonna be kind of in the middle chunk of Colossians chapter one. And we're gonna be looking at where Paul hypes up Jesus. He is like the, the hype man for Jesus, and, and he's using like just the biggest language that he can think of to talk about Jesus. And so I thought, just for a second, before we get to the passage, think about if you had, if you had like five words, or you had, had like the length of a tweet to describe Jesus, what would you make sure to include? What, what language? Feel free. This is the portion of the morning where you can yell something out. What words? What words? Love. Love. Perfect, holy, savior, Lord, good, good. Use this kind of language. Now, now here's a question. Is there any kind of language, positive language, that would be too high, 
that it would be too much. Let me ask it this way. Is there any ceiling to the language about Jesus? Is there any, you'd be like, oh, I wouldn't go that far. Oh, careful, careful, not, not that great. Is there, any, is there any ceiling to it? I wonder if when Paul's writing the letter to the Colossians, he's worried that they have a ceiling. He's worried that in their minds, because they had been culturally conditioned about in a culture that, that had many gods, that likely had a hierarchy to the gods, that maybe even had like a chain system by which you would access greater and greater gods, that Paul was concerned, oh no, I hope that the Colossians don't think that Jesus is just one in many and that he's like, like, he's like the regional manager or, or he's like the assistant to the regional manager. I hope they don't think Jesus is like the Dwight Schrute uh, that like you got to go through Dwight to get to Michael to eventually get to David Wallace. That's a reference for those of you that love The Office along with the rest of us. But I, I wonder if he's worried that, that they, they might have a ceiling on Jesus or that they've put him in like a, a rank. And what he wants to do at the beginning of this letter is just blow that wide open and be like, there is no ceiling. So let me do the best I can to use all the language to describe something that in many ways is indescribable. Let me try to describe to you who Jesus is. And in this section that we're going to look at this morning, he gives us what many believe was a hymn of the early church. Before anybody could read, before most people could read, before we had a Bible, the church had stories that they knew. Hey, have you heard this story about Jesus? Hey, did you hear this teaching about Jesus? Have you heard this song? Have you heard this creed? They had little statements that people would memorize, and we believe that this is one of those. So if you imagine like 2,000 years ago, the church gathering, and most of us couldn't read, and most of we didn't have a Bible. Maybe we had a little scroll. Maybe we had a little letter or something. This was maybe something that the church would gather around and sing or recite together. So we're going to look at this passage this morning, and there's, uh, there's kind of three parts to it. Uh, the first two parts are this hymn or this poem, and then the second part is a bit of a summary and a bit of a warning of that poem. So we're going to look at first, this is this, the first part of this hymn, beginning with verse 15. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all Creation, And I've highlighted all there because you're going to see all shows up many other times. And I think it's, this is part of Paul's like blowing the roof off. And, he, and as, you're conce- as you're conceptualizing Jesus, he's like, he's like some part. And he just keeps saying all, all, all. Firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So in the beginning of this, of this section, Paul is pointing out that Jesus is connected to the act of creation. He's trying to paint the, the, the picture that like when you think about creation, when you think about the creator God, I want you to think Jesus. Don't think creator God and Jesus. And, and, like, and then he creates Jesus. Think creator God alongside Jesus. Jesus was operational in the creation act. So I want to run through these, these three verses again and just pull out some, some important points. He begins, the sun is the image of the invisible God. This is to say, when you see Jesus, you see God. When you're wondering what God is like, look to Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God. I also think that we can look and we can see this word image and we know that Paul always has in mind the Genesis story where we are created to be image bearers, but we of course fail in that mission. And perhaps he's pointing us to, if you're wondering what a human should look like, if you're wondering what, what humanity, the perfect expression of humanity looks like, look to the image of the invisible God because that's what we were created to be. He begins, when you want to know what God is like, when you want to know what it's like to be fully human, fully alive, look to Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. And then he continues and he uses a word that's a little bit problematic sometimes, the firstborn over all creation. This word has given Christians trouble historically. And even today, there are, there are groups, different religions that would take this word and say, ah, see, Jesus is not God. Jesus was created by God. 
He was the first one created, and then God created the rest of us. This is a really important point. Some of you are gonna be like, oh, this is gonna go a little bit too much theology. I'm not here for theology. I'm here for feelings. I wanna feel good, okay? Sometimes you gotta think, okay? This is a really important point because there are still moments in your life today where someone may knock on your door and they will try to bring up this verse and they'll say, let me just tell you, you're going to a church where they tell you that Jesus is God. Jesus is not God. He was created. And let me show you a verse where it says he's he's the firstborn, okay? Three things, just really easy things to to kind of disprove that, to dismantle that, maybe four. One, the beginning one, the church has never believed that. The church, like universal church, historic church has always affirmed Jesus is fully God, okay? Okay? That's, that's just a free one, okay? But the three other ones. This word that Paul's using in the Hebrew mind, Paul has trained Hebrew mind, Old Testament, like in his blood, that word doesn't always have to mean like firstborn as like a succession, like he was the first, he came first. In fact, there's many stories in the Old Testament where the firstborn like loses that status and someone born later actually becomes named the firstborn because firstborn doesn't have to do with that. It has to do more with rank or superiority, or authority. And that's what Paul's pointing to by using this language. That's point number one. What is Paul thinking when he uses this word? Second one is the context of the passage in general isn't trying to convince us that Jesus is lower than. The context of the passage is trying to bump Jesus up. It's all about all, all, all. Paul's trying to elevate Jesus, not take Jesus down. Then the third point, and this is maybe the simplest one for you to remember if you ever get into this conversation, is that if you want to talk about the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus is God and not created, this isn't the verse to go to. This isn't what this passage is primarily focused on. So really simple, John chapter 1, verse 1. This is the place to go to if you want to talk about was Jesus created or what is he God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. That's referring to Jesus, his his pre-incarnate state. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Boy, that's really clear. Oh, phew. I was getting worried there for a second there, Pete. I had that firstborn up there for too long. Really simple. Now, again, this may seem like, ah, does that really, this is a really important piece of Christian theology, that Jesus is God, that when we see Jesus, we're seeing God that God is the one who came and died on the cross for us, not someone that God created and then said, go along now, die. That was God on the cross. This is essential to Christian theology. So don't surrender this point. Don't be fooled by the word firstborn into thinking, oh, oh, I'm confused. John 1, 1 was with God and the word was God. And then later on in that passage, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, which is to say that this pre-incarnate word became Jesus of Nazareth, and he walked among us. Continuing on on in those uh, those words that we just read, this is kind of verse 16 summarized. All things created in him, through him, for him. I think this is Paul's attempt to place Jesus alongside God the creator. That for perhaps the Jewish mind, they always had in mind a God the creator, And perhaps we're wondering, where does Jesus fit in all of this? And so he's trying to use language of like, Jesus was there in the creation and he's part of the creating event. And so all things are created in him, through him, for him. Like like he wants us to picture the father and the son and eventually in other passages and other places we read in scripture, the spirit all participating in creation. That we have this Trinitarian God, three in one, and that creation flows out of each one of them. It's not like there's one, and then he goes, I think I'm kind of lonely. I'm going to make another one. And then the two of them are like, oh, we should make a third. Like, no, that's not Christian theology. Christian theology is there has always been three in one. And I think this is Paul's attempt to try to place Jesus alongside the creator God. And then he says something that I find really interesting. Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. In him, all things hold together. So he's not just saying that Jesus was there at the creation, that everything was created through him, in him, for him. But he's saying Jesus is active right now in creation. He is active in holding all things together right now. Which is interesting to think about, that at every moment in human history, Jesus wills existence to continue. 
and you just start to think about some interesting moments. Just, you know, kind of play around with the, the image in your mind. This means that on the cross, when Jesus was dying, he continued to will creation to exist while he's being murdered by it. There's something about that, that the, that the God who comes to suffer alongside us sees enough good and value in the creation, in humans, that he would will it to continue even as it kills him. There's something about that. I don't have all the answers. It gets into mysterious things that I think we just reflect on when we talk about a good, loving God and the suffering that exists in the world. But there's something about imagining Jesus on the cross, willing existence to continue that I feel like I can bring, I can bring that God my suffering all of the questions that I have about suffering in the world, I can bring those questions to that God. And I feel like he has something unique to say because he experienced the worst. And he still said, but it's, there's still good here. It's, still, it's worth continuing on. It's worth that I continue to will the existence. There's something about this idea that Jesus holds it all together even in the worst of times. So that's the first part of the hymn, those first three verses. And it really focuses on Jesus as the creator. When you think creation, think Jesus. When you think God, think Jesus. That's kind of the first part of the hymn. And now we're going to read the second part of the hymn. And I want you to see if you can notice a shift. See if you notice a thematic shift. And I'll tell you what it is. But first, I want to see if you can notice it, okay? Because we're thinking this morning, right? Not just feeling all the time. Thinking, okay. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Did you, did you catch? Shit, I know, if you're just reading this first time, it's early, you're like, but, but just tell me the answers. I didn't come here for you to play question games. Okay, there's a shift from the first part talking about Jesus as creator to the second part talking about Jesus as redeemer. Jesus isn't just present in the creation of all things. He is also the driver. He's also the energy behind the redemption of all things. And so you can look at it this way too. The first part is create, Jesus as creator. Second part is Jesus as redeemer. You can also look at it as first part as the original creation. The second part as the new creation. Jesus is part of the first creation and then he is part of the redemption and the new creation. Which, which when you start to talk about those categories raises the question, Do you have a longing for new creation? Have you noticed that things aren't all perfect around here, like in our world in general? Do you ever notice like fractures in relationships? Maybe you have a child that you are estranged from. Maybe you're, you're fighting with a friend. Maybe you're, you're divorced or you're on your way. You feel like you're moving in that direction and you have a longing. Like, is there anybody who could redeem any of these things? Is there anybody who could bring something new into this situation? This poem was pointing towards Jesus. He didn't just create, but he can recreate. He can create newness. He can come and reconcile all things. You notice like the systemic injustice that we have in the world? Like you just look at the the gaps between the rich and the poor, all the ways that we are divided. And you're like, God, I don't even know how to sort out how broken the systems in our world are. And I'm longing for them to be made new. And Paul's like, Jesus is the one who can bring newness into those things. He's the one that can redeem those things. Have you ever noticed just like your, even your body? Depending how old you are, you, you will notice like a longing for a new body. Like I'm 37, but I feel like 20. And when I'm with 20 year olds, they look at me like, mm, you're not like us. Uh, and, and the more that like I try to like have the same workout regimen that I've had for the last couple decades, like I'm noticing like my body, oh, it's taking a long time to recover these days. And like I got a knee that's bad and sore all the time and complain about it all the time. You ever notice like your body, you just start to notice like it's kind of breaking down and you have a longing, like I wish that I had a body that wouldn't break down like this. And Paul's like, Jesus is the one that will give us new bodies. He's the one that will redeem our fallen bodies and give us new bodies. 
newness of creation. So Jesus is the creator and he's the, the redeemer. So where does that happen? If you want to experience newness, you're like, I like this idea. Okay, Jesus is the redeemer. Where, where, how does one access that? In the person of Jesus, yes. But Paul points us to something really unique that I think we can miss. Because sometimes we, we miss this piece of, uh, of when, when we're reading through the New Testament. He points us to where this new creation, where this redemption can be found. And it's in verse 18. It says this, he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. I highlighted this word firstborn because it's actually linked in the Greek to the word that we have for prototype. It's kind of like the, the first among something that we're supposed to emulate afterwards. And, uh, and so when you're thinking about, 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 um, about experiencing this newness of life, it's like Jesus is the first from among the dead and we are to follow after him to experience this newness of life. But he says that this happens in the body, the church. Jesus is the head of a body, and if you want to be a part of this newness, of this redemption, then you should place yourself within the body. And I find that as time rolls on, that, that, that as, um, as Christian things kind of like, like ideas kind of wax and wane, that Jesus still has like a, you know, there's still some cultural relevance there, but you know what's losing a ton of, of like any sort of like gravitas in the, in the world is the idea of the church, like, people want Jesus, and they don't want the church. And yet, everywhere Paul connects, like, if you want Jesus, he's found in his body. And so some questions for us this morning is to think, if I really want to begin to taste of the resurrected life, to begin to taste of new creation here and now, well, do I consider myself to be a part of the body, a part of the church? If there's anything that our age is bringing, and I think that part of it is the digital aspect that we have, but it can happen whether you're watching online or whether you're sitting here in person right now, is a, is a passivity, a passive consumption of religious goods and services. That you come here to get ideas for your personal spiritual journey. And everywhere in the New Testament, that kind of language is foreign that you are on a personal journey, everywhere you are invited to come and be a part of something bigger than you, to be a part of a body. And so some questions to ask yourself is like, am I part of the church? Do I consider myself part of the church? Well, are you part of making Jesus' body visible? Are you using your gifts to serve in his church? When you become a follower of Jesus, the Spirit awakens these gifts that God has given you, gifts that are meant to serve the church to make Jesus' body visible in the world. Would you be able to point to places where you're like, this is where I do this. This is where I serve. This is where I give of my time. We had an announcement earlier, if you were here earlier, uh, early enough to hear the announcements about the big serve, which is coming up in about four weeks from now. But it's a time where we as the body of Christ move outside of these four walls and serve in the community so that people could see the love of Jesus with flesh on. Not just hear about the love of Jesus, but that they would see his love in action. And so if you're wondering, like, I, I want to be a part of the body, that's a, that's a great place for you to step into. Low commitment, for those who are commitment phobic, low commit, like it's like a one-time thing, and it's really easy to sign up. Just go on our website, look for the Big Serve, click on it, and you'll see all the different opportunities that you can sign up for and be a part of. Now, last week, I gave you a memory verse. Who, who remembers the memory verse? Anybody? Anybody do the memory verse? I did the memory verse. Remember, I said I was gonna pray for you? Even without a voice, I prayed for you all week long. And I ended the prayer each day with the memory verse, and I found like just this richness. The, the memory verse was, for he has rescued us out of the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom there is redemption and forgiveness. And I ended the prayer each day with those words and I just, there was just like a richness to it. There, there's something about when we memorize scripture that like it feeds us, it becomes this lens through which we begin to see the world. And so I'm gonna give you a new one today for anybody. I know like sometimes you hear memory verses like this is not just for the kids. No, it's for, it's for the grownups. And it's probably one of the most valuable things that I do as I prepare a sermon each week. And it's one of the joys that I get to have is it's like, it's part of my job that I got to memorize scripture. But there's such a joy to it. And so, so the memory verse this week is, um, is verses 19 and 20. And I know it's longer. Whew. 
It's longer. Who, you're gonna have to miss some Netflix episodes in order to, to, like, to memorize this. But uh, for, first of all, before we read it, the reason why I picked this verse is because when you think about we are to be the visible body of Christ, we're the ones who are to proclaim him to the world. This is what we're proclaiming. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I highlighted a few things here. Have his fullness dwell. Is, is part of God revealed in Jesus? No, all of God, the fullness of God is revealed in Jesus. Through him to reconcile to himself all things. You'll probably hear me say that if you stick around here for any length of time, you'll hear me say all the time, the reconciliation of all things. And if you ever wonder, where does he get that language from? I get it from here. Through him to reconcile himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, when you think about what Jesus is doing, he's pulling heaven and earth back together by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's read this. Let's read this together. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, lastly, this morning, we're gonna look at the last three verses of kind of the, this section, which I think are a bit of a summary and also include a bit of a warning to the Colossians and to us today. Paul says this, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. I don't know, those are just beautiful words to reflect on. Once you were alienated from, once you were alienated, the feeling of being alienated from God in your own mind, like you knew it, like if you had any time of peace and quiet and thought about it, you knew that you were alienated from your father. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. That is his death on the cross to present you holy in his sight. When God looks at you because of Jesus, because you are in Jesus, he sees you as holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Beautiful. But then Paul hits us with a bit of a warning. If, oh, there's an if. If. It, all of that, if you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope. This is the temptation to move off of Jesus. You heard about Jesus. Paul's like, there is no ceiling to Jesus. If you've seen Jesus, then you have seen the Father. If you've seen Jesus, then you've seen the image of the invisible God. If you have Jesus, then you need nothing else. And the temptation will be to move off of Jesus. I see this in, in two ways often when I talk to people. One is this, and if you ever want to get on a preacher's nerves, say something in the ballpark of this to them. You know, I feel like I'm just not being fed. I, want, I feel like I want to go deeper. Deeper. Because you, you've nailed it all already. You got it all. Like, I hear love God and love people follow Jesus. I'm like, oh, that's enough for a lifetime. Like, how... How much more do you need? Like sometimes I wonder, are you looking for like a lifetime of learning? Because you could have a lifetime of learning and never become more like Jesus. So I think there can be a trap. I love learning. Obviously, I love learning. I teach. Learning is great. But there is a bit of a trap to learning, to think that you're only growing when you're learning. And to think that every part of your experience is just learning. I just want to learn. I learned the Greek and then I learned how this is actually part of this Hebrew thing. And, and I learned this. Like those are all great and they can, they can build us up in different ways. But there is a trap to that, to that posture of saying, I, I got to come and I got to learn something new. 
every day. The other one is you hear this in all different ways in our culture right now, which is kind of like a, you know, I started with Jesus, but now I'm kind of transcending Jesus. Like Jesus was a good path, but now I'm kind of seeing that, that he was like, you know, he's, he's one of many spiritual teachers and, and there's things that I'm learning from other religions, from other spiritual gurus that I find are, are feeding me. And so, and so I kind of want to add some things to Jesus. And I think Paul would say, don't, don't move on from this hope. You don't need anything more plus Jesus. I think of it this way, like remember last week I talked about the parable that Jesus told about the guy that finds a treasure buried in a field. He finds this treasure. It's like he's saying like, once you find that treasure, don't be tempted to think that you can do better. It'd be like the guy who finds the treasure in a field and instead of selling everything in great joy just so he can have that, you find the treasure in the field and you're like, it's pretty good, but I wonder if I can do better. And Paul is like each one of us sitting on the couch yelling at the person on the game show who is thinking that they can make a better deal. And you're like, stick with the deal. Stick with this. Don't open up more suitcases. Don't keep going. You've got it. Like, end the game. You know when you watch a game show and someone's like got a great prize and they're like, I'm gonna risk it all. Paul's like, there's no need to risk it all. There's no need to move on from this hope. And so this passage ends with a warning. Jesus, there is no ceiling to him. Don't try to transcend him. Don't try to move on from him. Don't try to think that, that you gotta get everything so complicated in order to truly be following him. And so this morning I thought to end that we would just read through the passage once more, but with kind of a spirit of prayer and to read through it as like a confession. And so whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, I invite you to read through this and I'm gonna read through it slowly. I'm gonna add my own words, but it'll be on the screen if you wanna look at it. And we're just gonna pray through the passage as a reminder that our goal is to become followers of Jesus, to become Jesus people. Not as one theologian, as one teacher said, his name was is actually Glenn Packiam. I heard this great phrase that he used. He said, our goal is not to become generic God people, which is easy to think because we live in a culture now where lots of people don't even believe in God. But in Paul's world, everybody believed in God and the gods. And the goal for Paul was never, I hope I can get people to believe in God. And it would be easy for us in our culture to think that the goal is to get people to believe in God. But that's not the goal. The goal is not to become generic God people, spiritual people. The goal is to become Jesus people, which is why when Paul writes this letter to this group of people in Colossae, he starts with Jesus. So let's pray through this part of his letter. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. God, we thank you that when we wonder what you are like, we can look at Jesus. That when we look at Jesus, all of our wondering can end. Any anxiety that we feel about, do we really know you? Is there more? Are we missing something? All of it can end. Because Jesus, you are the image of the invisible God. You are first, you are supreme, you have authority over all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus, we thank you for your role in creation, for the act of creation, and for the act of continuing to hold all things together, which means that in some way, in every moment, you are holding us. In the moments when we feel like we are falling apart, you're holding us together. 
because there's something good coming on the other side of whatever we're going through. But Jesus, you did not just create, you redeem. You are the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Jesus, we thank you that because you are alive, there is hope that we will also pass through death and experience resurrection. That the life that we live right now with God will not have an end. Our life with God will go on forever. Jesus, we thank you for that amazing gift. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Jesus, what does it mean that you will reconcile all things? Paul, you speak about it as though it's already happened and yet we can see with our eyes that clearly it has not all happened. And yet he says it as though it's already happened because he is so sure that Jesus, you will reconcile all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus, this reconciliation, this peace, it was not free. It cost you your life. We thank you. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior, but now he has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death to present us holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Mm. If we continue in the faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that we have heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which Paul had become a servant. God, we thank you for the richness of these words that for centuries we have been able to dwell on, we have been able to feast upon, that have changed the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see the world. God, may they be transforming our knowledge of you. May they transform how we leave this place. May we memorize these words and find that they are nourishing our souls. Jesus, may we never move on from you. May we never be convinced that there is more than you, that there is a ceiling and that there's something above you. You are supreme. You are all we need. And because of you, we are so much richer than we think. Jesus, we thank you. Spirit, we thank you. Father, we thank you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.